face to face, hand to hand, film to film. Welcome to the Film to Film podcast. My name is James Shergan. I am joined by my good friend Inyaki and Liniero. How are you doing today? Doing well. How about you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Today we are mixing it up a little bit. Uh, it was my pick and uh, we are not doing uh, something from the grand country of Italy, but instead we are going Gasp. over uh, halfway, or, well, pretty much all the way around the world to uh, Hong Kong uh, for 1986 Royal Warriors. Um, all right, so like, I'm going to give you the quick synopsis, and then uh, you can let me know what you thought of the synopsis, and then let me know what you thought of the movie. Um, okay, uh, a Hong Kong police officer, Michelle Yeoh, and a flight security agent, Michael Wong, form an alliance to foil a hijacking. <laughs> Not much of a, a synopsis there. I think there's a little bit more to this film than that. Yeah, I think that's a terrible synopsis, um, especially because that's, like, what, the first 20 minutes of the movie? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, uh, I, I read through a couple synopses of this, and most of them were too long, so I chose the shortest one. Um because this film really does have quite a simple plot. Uh, but anyways, uh, we will get into that as we uh, get into the film. What did you uh, think of the movie? Uh, it, it was, uh, a, I mean, let's start with this. It was a very fun movie to watch. Um, it was highly entertaining. Um, the action, uh, the stunts, uh, the different mixing of martial arts all of that was extremely fun um so i mean i, I highly enjoyed this movie i highly enjoyed it uh, uh is it a great movie no it, it's a product of its time i think it's a very 80s film also uh sure it's from hong kong but it, it had lots of 80s elements so yeah yeah very 80s indeed uh all the way down to its synth score uh and its tic-tac-toe bar named california in hong kong mm -hmm. um some extremely 80s moments you know i used to be very anti-80s it's still not my favorite decade but i have come around to some of it uh, and this this film does have a lot of stuff that i do like from the 80s i think so uh for me actually this is a blind one i had not seen this film before i thought it'd be fun to just try oh. uh, something new um it has a really good reputation amongst uh like some podcasts and stuff i've listened to uh specifically mm -hmm. twitch of the death nerve podcast uh they really shouted this film out so uh i was like why not let's just take a shot on this uh, i've been wanting to bring uh some hong kong action over to the film tone podcast too and just uh i thought it'd be a fun watch uh for us to do and just discuss the film too so uh yeah so chose this one just because of kind of surely its reputation hmm. yeah no um i think i i saw a clip of this once in uh like at a youtube channel called uh, um, uh what's it called uh VFX artists react, or I think it's called. Uh, actually, I think it's a stunt double react, which is just stunt like they have folks like looking at think uh, at clips of different movies, and I think there, there was a clip of this film in there too. Uh, and you know they were gushing over it, and, and then while watching this home film, it's like yeah, it would be gushing over that if probably if you're stunt double, because uh, the shit they do is pretty impressive, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, no one does it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very much of its time, uh, Hong Kong in like the 1980s. This is like in the golden age of Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong. I, so let, let's quickly talk um, just kind of about our own because we haven't t done a lot of Hong Kong films. We did Election, which is 2005, very different era of Hong Kong cinema there. Um, and that's like post Infernal Affairs has a totally different look, post handover as well. Um, have you seen uh, a lot of films from Hong Kong? And what is kind of your. Uh, what have you thought of what you've seen so far? So I've, I've, I've only seen a couple of Jackie Chan films mm -hmm. from Hong Kong. Uh, usually when they were on TV, like, like you know, you would be flipping channels and Jackie Chan was on and you're like, okay, I, you know, it's going to be a solid film. Uh, they were terribly dubbed, but beyond that, it was uh, highly entertaining and lots of really good martial arts. Um, usually him being a cop or a detective or, you know, some sort of one or the other uh, and whenever you saw something you're like huh I wonder if he got hurt and then <laughs> later you would learn it's like yeah that person almost died yeah 
Uh, <laughs> Jack or Jackie Chan broke his skull like seven times in this film, just making it. Um, so I mean, I mean, uh, so when it comes to like Hong Kong films, uh, of course, it is very highly limited to Jackie Chan because I think that's what's mostly on TV. But uh, I, in 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 all case, I understand what they're about, and they're about police doing police shit and getting into fights and lots of shooting, and lots of kicking, and lots of flying, and lots of stunt doubles getting hurt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the appeal of these films is no secret. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty much front and center. And this film does come out uh, kind of just in the uh, golden age of Jackie Chan, a year after Police Story, 1985, uh, which is kind of like that Ooh. seminal, uh, pivotal uh, Jackie Chan film from that era. So uh, bringing it more uh, into the contemporary action. Because, you know, you and I have watched a lot of films together, and Hong Kong is, uh, I think it's probably like my third or fourth most viewed uh, country, uh, probably behind Italy, Japan, and the U.S. Um, as far as Ooh. films viewed. But I don't know that you and I have watched a ton from Hong Kong together. Uh, now we watched uh, a few um, Kung Fu films, but those are the more like historical mm -hmm. or set in the past i don't know if it's a historical dramas per se but you know costume dramas if you right, will. right right so we've we've seen we've seen a bunch of those uh together but together we we only saw modern hong kong films like election and infernal affairs infernal affairs and a bunch of a bunch more right right uh okay but yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, those chop sake, more historical setting, martial arts films were definitely, like, the popular films of, like, the 60s and the 70s. And then um, mm -hmm. I think largely due to Jackie Chan and films like Police Story, uh, these more contemporary set um, action films kind of became more of the norm in the 80s. So this comes out in 1986, so right kind of in that uh, golden era of times. Um, one other... Yeah. Yeah, and what... Uh, what, what go ahead. One thing I wanted to note uh, on, on that is what... what what, I'm also curious if perhaps they were uh, Hong Kong was like a few years behind um, national like global trends because uh, you know like in the 80s uh, cop movies in uh, sorry in the 70s cop movies were the thing in the US at the early 70s and then in Italy you had the Poliziotteschis which were also the thing and then in the 80s is when in Hong Kong you started getting the 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 police movies and not only you get the police movies but all the cliches I, or, I mean I started like writing down each cliche I saw that probably was already in a film yeah uh, in an American film yeah th and and they were like 100% just obvious there and sometimes they didn't even make sense yeah yeah I mean this film goes from like Terminator to Dirty Harry in about five minutes uh, in just terms uh -huh. of some of like the lines it's tearing uh taking from um I, I don't think you're wrong i mean terminator came out like i think 1984 so just a couple of years before this but dirty hair obviously already like 10 15 years old so uh yeah uh, what about um lethal weapon i think lethal weapon is after this film um oh really yeah. okay uh here i'll fact check that real fast i think it's late 80s is what i remember for the first lethal weapon um but yeah you're right i mean i don't know if it just lagged behind First Lethal Weapon was a year after this, so 1987. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, in terms of, like, coming to the cop films and stuff like that, I do feel like these Hong Kong films have a very different feel to that, mainly because there's usually a lot more martial arts and stuff like that, which you're not seeing, like, Clint Eastwood or, or uh, like, Maurizio Merrily and the Palizio Teskis do necessarily kung fu. It's more just, like, straight-up fist fights. Uh, and less of like the martial arts and kicking and stuff like that that happens in these uh, kung fu films. Uh, right, right. Um, yeah, so a um, couple interesting things. I mean, Hong Kong cinema has always been very export oriented because it is such a small place. And so it's specifically uh, first sort of oriented around exporting films to Chinese speaking uh, places that are broad. So places like Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, um, uh, the Chinese speaking community in the US, uh, different places like that. Um, so it's always been very, very export oriented. 
per capita, it was like the largest producer of just like raw amounts of films, uh, I think until Ooh. the handover and it became part of mainland China. Um, and I think it did slowly start to die out there. So this is very much um, kind of in that era, pre handover, the director, David Chung, uh, worked a lot as a cinematographer, he directed five or six films and he worked basically till 1995. Handover was in 1997, pretty common. Um, that's why we had a ton of Hong Kong directors coming over to the US in the 90s, people like John Wu, Choi Hark, a lot of Hong Kong directors kind of took their shot at Hollywood uh, because of like uh, going over to mainland China and stuff like that. Um, another interesting thing too is all three of these leads, none of them are local talent. Uh, we have Michelle Yeoh, who is uh, actually Malaysian Chinese, so ethnically Chinese, but uh, a, a born in Malaysia, grew up in Malaysia. Um, she was a model. Mm -hmm. This is something like her second or third film. Uh, so it's fun to see her so early. She is getting some buzz these days still with uh, a film that just came out called Everything Everywhere All at Once, a right. A24 film. Um, of course, she's in Crouching Tiger. She also paired, uh, interestingly, with Hiroyuki Sonata, who plays the Japanese here, in another film uh, that came out about 15 years ago uh, that is the U.S. sci-fi directed by um, Danny Boyle, Sunshine, which is a film I like quite a bit, too. Um, yeah, uh, what's your, uh, how do you feel about um, some of the leads here? Uh, we actually have some names that have come over to the U.S. Um, uh, on a few different things with Sonata and Michelle Yeoh. I mean, they're all great. Uh, uh, they're, they're fun, fun to watch. Um, I mean, uh, 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 Michelle uh, is a little bit cartoony when it comes to the beginning. Like when, when she first uh, introduces herself and things like that, it almost feels like a, a children's show. She's like mugging for the camera and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, as the film progresses, she gets better. I mean... Uh, the film does fall a little bit when it comes to the drama. And, um, I think that's uh, its weakest uh, point. But uh, still, she she's hi she's highly entertaining, uh, and also she can fight. Yeah, she's a great. Or, or it looks like she can fight she, very, really yeah, well. Yeah, she's a great physical performer. Um, I think she is clearly just a really good athlete and the way that she does the stunts and stuff. I mean, she, she sells it. I'm sure there's a stunt person uh, used at certain points, but she's yeah, definitely <laughs> doing a lot of stuff herself too. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the same thing goes with uh, Hiroyuki Sonata. How'd you like him? He's kind of like the uh, Japanese actor that he appears in a lot of stuff. He's like the guy in Last Samurai. He was in Lost for five or six episodes. He's in a variety of stuff um, still these days. Uh, how'd you like him? Yeah, with him, um, I feel like we didn't get enough of him. Okay. Uh, in a way, like uh, he, he's not. Although he's a main character, he is not. I mean, he's out of the movie for a fair share. I mean, I would say this is kind of like three more or less equal leads, uh, but yeah, he he's kind of in like the first half, and then he goes away until the finale. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I mean, I mean, he he definitely has a presence uh, when whenever he's uh, whenever he's fighting. Um, and I mean, like this is with any movies it's been like even in shitty movies like uh, Mortal Kombat. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a he, scorpion, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is, and he's like the best thing about the movie. Oh really? Okay. Uh, I've not seen it. Um, I mean, he's kind of wasted, but uh, but yeah, in short, I think he. He's he's good. He, he's just he, he's not used as much, uh, but that that also perhaps is because you know this is like he was not that he was not big in, back then. I'm assuming. I mean, he's clearly young. I mean, there's one thing about this film that really stands out to me is how young the performers are. It's like I think Sonata is like 25 or 26. He's the oldest. Michelle Yeoh is 23 or 24, and Michael Wong is uh, 19. <laughs> when he filmed this film, so uh, who who is the third lead? And I think probably the lead that uh, we might speak most critically of uh, of them, uh, Michael Wong, uh, <laughs> who kind of is uh, uh, stalkery, uh, plays a lead that would probably not make it uh, in Hollywood twenty twenty two. He is actually a Chinese American actor. He's half Chinese, um, and he speaks not great 
Cantonese too. So that's supposed to be part of the character too, is he's a little uh, awkward around Chinese and stuff like that. Um, so he's meant very much meant to be an outsider. Uh, so that's something that might shift perspective just a little bit. I'm not going to really defend his role. Um, I think he's. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know that he totally pulls off the role uh, that great. I mean, I think this is probably the weakest part of the movie. I do like some parts that they do create, kind of like the gender reversal where Michelle is having to save him and he's more playing the damsel in distress, but the guy in distress. Uh, but yeah, he's got to like talk to a fish, uh, kind of like. Robert De Niro style where he's like monologuing to himself and Michael Wong is no Robert De Niro I'll put it that way uh yeah I mean I think he got uh the lower end of the uh, I don't know I, I mean I think the character himself was uh not a very well written character so I mean there's that uh Add to that that uh, he himself is super young, super young, and uh, I don't know. It, like, so the, the fish scene that you're talking about, like, which I wrote wrote down, and like, <laughs> it 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 makes sense in, in a way, like as a as a as a concept. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, like, why did they do it? I don't know uh, why did it happen, I, I, but it, it perhaps to give more weight to you know the the moment perhaps, but yeah the the char- the, the actor was not strong enough to pull that off, but also the uh, I mean I, I think all the non action scenes in this movie were not good like all, all, I think all the action non action scenes were just not good. <laughs> uh, they were not bad, but they were not good. And I mean, thankfully, there's, there's only, it, there is a lot of action in this film. Um, exactly. I'm, I'm struggling to even think of the non Michael Wong uh, act, acting that happens in this film. Uh, like, there's just frankly not a lot. Most of the he, so Michael Wong clearly is like he's not martial arts trained or anything like that. So he's the he's the lead of the three that fights the least. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think as a result, he probably has like kind of more than his fair share of uh, like dialogue and stuff. His storyline is carried throughout the film. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you like him uh, as he uh, as he was falling off the building, saying, "I love you, Michelle." <laughs> I mean, the, 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 those are the, the, those are the things where I'm like, they they did they did the character justice, almost. Um, so in the sense that like I-, I thought that was a really like novel way of killing your most annoying character in the movie uh, and you know I almost felt like oh almost uh, but then you know the-, the movie goes into the next scene being you know, highly melodramatic uh, with the music with her sad and receiving the flower the last flowers that he sent her with this with the pictures with him putting stupid faces and I was just like no it's not warranted none of the, uh, that's not like his character did not warrant any of the mel- melodrama <laughs> that is coming after his death it's just not warranted uh, in, in, like ri- either written or performed you know, through a performance or through the writing it's just not warranted perhaps I've become a little bit more accustomed to this type of film uh, did I feel emotionally moved by those scenes after but I, I, I was like, okay, I get it. I get what they're going for here. Um, I, they're giving Michelle... I thought Michelle Yeoh did a decent job of selling sort of like the funeral scene where she like turns to the camera and says, I'm going to kill you. Oh, the, uh, the, funeral, the funeral was great. I'm talking about... Okay. So there's a... There's, the flower delivery. The funeral scene actually is pretty decent. Uh, or mo- one of the more entertaining scenes, if you will. But I'm talking about like... So when he dies, between that and the funeral... There's this whole montage of like her receiving the last flowers that he he bought for her, the which was right before he got kidnapped. Uh, it's her looking at the pictures from the previous flowers and the, just a sad mu- music, you know, holding onto her face as she sees she's sad and crying, but she's not that great of an actor back then, so she's not really do- selling it either. So. 
they really amped up the music and make it very melodramatic with like almost a sepia tone and none of that was warranted none of that the funeral like you could have gone from his death to then the funeral where everyone is sad and then her doing her threat that would have been fine but you you had that middle point that reminds you of his stupid face and and, and the, the reason I point all of, point this out is because I think his death that the, the the way he kills himself to to save her is great there's lots of tension and uh, he does it he jumps he he you know he says I love you as he's falling and there's clearly and, someone and you, falling from that building too uh, well, oh well, like, oh, it's not it's I not mean, an the, Italian the dummy dead. <laughs> no, no, there's 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 a man who is falling, and you know, and you feel for it, and you feel for the moment, and you feel for him. But then the movie takes it at a whole new, a whole new level, and you no longer feel for him. And then the bad guy takes it to a whole new level. Where he's like, oh, I got his coffin. Yeah. And I'm gonna... We'll get into that later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're like, I, I, and at that point, I'm just like, is it, I think this is cultural. <laughs> because. I mean, I, I, I was kind of all in for the coffin stuff. I'm like, oh, I like how, how far this bad guy is taking it. Because. <laughs> I, I mean, I. I, I I don't blame the bad guy. The bad guy is fucking nuts. I'm saying the good guys uh, they jump onto this, and you know I'm like, okay, this must be cultural, and or I'm missing something because. Hey man, if uh, if someone digs up my coffin after I die and does that, I fully expect you to drive in with an armored car and take him out. The fucking tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. We'll get to that. But I was all in for all of that stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was. It was a great. It was a great set. Piece. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I I thought there was a couple moments in the film that at least knowingly talk about Michael Wong, so that like the film is at least a little bit self aware. Um, like, there's one point where Michelle Yeoh calls him out and just like. Uh, you're super annoying, you don't take anything seriously, and stuff like that. And he just kind of has, like, this dumbass look on his face. Um, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of like this scene, uh, how stupid he looks after. And then there's another moment where after he figures out uh, that who the uh, fourth uh, Chinese veteran is, the fourth villain, um, the uh, he's, like, trying to convince the uh, him that he's, he's just going to drive with him or something. And then the guy says, like, you're a terrible actor. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I kind of like it that someone just said to Michael Wong's face, you're a terrible actor. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think that at least uh, those scenes gave a little bit of uh, payoff to his uh, rather subpar performance. Uh, well, I so I don't blame the actor as much as you do. Okay, uh, fair I, enough. I think, I, think, I think the character was written to be highly irritating. Uh, and I think, you know... Uh, they have an okay actor playing a highly irritating character. Okay, fair enough. But it's really it's really hard to do pull a good job unless it like you know, very very few people can do that. Right, right. Um, well, uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is part of a uh, a series of films called In the Line of Duty. Uh, there's like eight or nine that came out. And most of them are not even called In the Line of Duty, but Michael Wong uh, does come back for In the Line of Duty 4 playing a different, playing a very similar character, but in that film he is supposedly cast as the villain instead of uh, like as a character you're supposed to be rooting for, but similar oh. vibes. And that one is also interestingly set in Seattle. Oh. And obviously probably filmed in Vancouver. Uh, as everything is oh. that's it, that's up here. Yeah. But uh, I have not seen that film, but perhaps that could be a fun one to see in the future, just because yeah. it's a city uh, that we know. And that one stars um, Donnie Yen, who was in like uh, that Star Wars film, a um, bunch of. He's kind of more of your mm -hmm. contemporary uh, star. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's enough on Michael Wong. Other than, how do you think he got hired? How do you think a nine-year-old, nineteen-year-old gets hired? Was it like a tight labor market again, like the current economy works? experiencing they're just like oh we'll hire anyone we need we just need some <laughs> we need some guns in the air uh the dude is super good looking so i i wouldn't be i mean i mean granted i'm i'm in 
you know, like I, I thought he was really good looking. I'm assuming that perhaps he was a model. Uh, uh, that's probably a good guess. That's what I would guess too. Do, I actually don't know, but yeah, I think I do yeah, think that's I'm, a good guess. Yeah, I'm thinking as a model, and then that that plus some some family connections probably uh, will get you the role. Mm-hmm. So you think that's how he got both his acting role and his role as the air marshal? <laughs> He's a good-looking guy that uh, had good family connections. <laughs> I mean, air marshals are not like. Let, let's be clear. Air marshals are you know regular cops, right? Which or even lesser could be a security guard. I feel like uh, Michelle Wong and uh, no Michelle. Was it Michelle? Michelle uh, Yeo. Michael Wong. Michelle yeah, Mich- Yeo. No, Mich- yeah, Michelle Yeoh and uh, what's the name of the Japanese actor? Uh, Hiroyuki um, Sonata. Yeah, uh, Hiroyuki. They both, their characters are superheroes. Yeah. Uh, the Michael Wong, his character is a regular guy. He's there, a regular cop. It's a, it's a, I mean, he did his thing. He pulled his gun. He he kicked a couple of th- people, uh, neutralized some people, yeah. and that's it. That's all he needed to do. That's all a real cop does. The other ones, you were you know, shoving folks' uh, heads out of planes. Yeah, repressurizing uh, the cabin by doing that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, Boeing has considered that as a solution if something goes wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, they they were the ones who were fighting, uh, you know, villains that. Uh, that could uh, run as fast as a fucking car, you know. Uh, they were doing the crazy the, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was no, he was a regular cop. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's fine. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Um, one funny thing is Michelle Yeoh and Michael Wong. They both have the very Hong Kong thing done to them, where Michelle Yeoh is cast as Michelle and Michael Wong is cast as Michael which makes their names very easy to rec- uh, remember. Um, Hiroyuki Sonata did have his name changed. Uh, I forget what it is in this film. Um, but I wrote it down somewhere. One second. Yeah. Um, but uh, just as a whole, uh, we'll get into some of the set pieces in just a moment here. But uh, I think it's Yamamoto. Yama, uh, Yamamoto? Yeah, Yamamoto. Okay. Ja, uh, ya, Yamamoto. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, the action, I think, is certainly the highlight of this film. So in some senses, it kind of has a very similar structure to uh, Giallo, where sometimes the stuff in between, the kills or whatever, don't stand out. But like the set pieces are kind of like the main highlights of the film. And for me, I just love this era of Hong Kong action, the speed and brutality of the performers. One thing I do also like about this film, too, is it's less comedy heavy and comedy from Hong Kong, for me, doesn't always work. It can be a little bit too broad um, for what I'm, uh, for what I personally like. And I know that people's uh, opinions there do tend to vary, um, especially uh, because so much of them uh, are comedies. And this one I would say is, leans more into the dark, uh, dark end of it, which tends to be uh, what I like. Uh, Any just kind of general thoughts on the action before we get into some of the set pieces? I mean, they're all great. But I, there's just not much to say yeah, yeah. beyond that. They're also varied too. I mean, that's one thing I liked about them is like there's just so much variety of weaponry and things. Like a car chase yeah. evolves into something else very fast. Yeah, no, I, I, indeed. I mean, I, I, it, they're they're super fluid. They're very well written in the in the sense that, uh, and I think when once once we get to you know the set the set pieces, we can do a better job at it. But they they definitely tell a story within the fight. Uh, there's lots of problem solving uh, that each character has to go through during the fights that are just very interesting. Uh, where it amps, like it keeps on, you know, building a story of what's happening through the moment. So you're not confused. And and this is an area where you know, like when, it, like I remember watching Te- uh, Taken or in the Born era, where the the fights are just jumbled, hard to see. And the the construction of a story is really hard to follow, and they become they become boring. And there's no Same sense with, of space uh, or anything like that. Exactly. Same happens to, even with today Marvel movies, uh, with the exception of uh, Shang Chi. Most of the Marvel movies also sort of like is just uh, 
too bloated with uh, with things, uh, and at the end you start losing part of it. Not all the Marvel movies, actually. Uh, that that's being unfair. Tons of movies do have uh, lots of good uh, action, uh, like the Captain America two was had some really good action in there, but lots of other ones. Just the the final the final battle becomes just too dense that you stop following it and you start glazing over. Here instead, uh, everything is just nice, neat, easy to follow, but at the same time, uh, follow the story of what's happening within the fight. And also it's fun to watch uh, the, the last thing in this is styles of fighting. Uh, I think it, it emphasized, especially with, uh, with the very first time you see them fighting. When, when first time you see uh, Michelle fighting, is that her style is probably kung fu uh, while she's being attacked by folks with kitanas uh, which is more of a japanese type of fight uh, fight uh, sword fighting from there you see it once again with uh, again michelle and a japanese actor forgetting his name again. Uh, sonata or yamamoto S S sonata the character yamamoto um who clearly has a Japanese style of fighting and it's not Kung Fu and you get to see those differences. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very different. I mean, they're also, I think Sonata and uh, Michelle Yeoh are both very gifted physical performers, just the way that they are moving around. And I, I just love the rhythm that they have here. So yeah, let's just get into some of these uh, set pieces. Uh, we'll skip over the intro, even though it's kind of fun, uh, just for kind of the more major ones and go straight to the airplane, uh, which is a, a scene that is a little different to watch uh, post 9-11 uh, post in some ways. I mean, there is a lot going yeah. on in this plane. Uh, we can talk about some of the poor decisions that characters make in terms of uh, where they choose to have their battles. Uh, somehow this is uh, this is definitely in the running for the worst decision of like why are you trying to rescue your friend in an airplane with a grenade? <laughs> is that is this such a great decision? Um, but somehow that may not be the worst decision that someone made uh, in this film on where to fight. Um, yeah, uh, I I really like this set piece. I like kind of like the close quarter nature of the airplane, and it just does a great mm -hmm. job of like just jumping you right into it and it just sets sort of like the fast and furious uh nature we have like uh like things uh with all the snacks and stuff getting tossed at people uh i like that uh you know michelle yo beats the shit out of people but she also mm -hmm. like they don't treat her with the kitty gloves either she like gets tossed around she goes she goes through stuff i feel like it's something you don't see a ton of uh, i'm not going to say you don't ever see it but it's like i like that they're showing the fight and it looks painful like it looks like it freaking hurts uh and i uh yeah I, I really like this i don't think it's my favorite set piece in the whole film but i think it's a great way to just get the film started with the, just a ton of energy and chaos yeah i agree i i mean i i actually don't think that the uh, plan was that bad personally i don't like so generally what do hijackers do when they take a plane why why do folks do not fight against them it's usually because they have some explosive explosive device so here you have a hijackers with a grenade that's perhaps not the most uh, useful exploding, explode, like, exploding device because it's actually their explosions are rather small. It's more shrapnel than anything else. But uh, the whole point is, uh, you know, that, that's a threat, threat enough for everyone to calm down and have the plane divert to where, wherever else it was supposed to land. I see. Uh, I to let the, the guy free. The thing, the whole point is that they didn't know they had two superheroes, two super mar like martial art heroes in that plane. Yeah, neither of which was the law enforcement. I mean, they immediately execute like the two law enforcement officers too. Uh, yeah, which was smart, and I mean, just shows you that this film is going to have a body count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. So I mean, well, I mean, in, in that sense, like the movie also showed the brutality of the bad guys because you know they they just. They just killed the cops, like the two cops, even if it, even when they were following the other orders. Um, but uh, I, I, I mean, it was a fun movie. It was a fun fight scene. I do, I did love uh, the use of the uh, the food cart. Uh, grant, granted, uh, in real life, uh, pretty sure if you get hit by one of those carts, 
uh, you would die automatically because, like, if you were a pin, because those carts are heavy as hell. They are heavy. Uh, so they were 100% empty. And it was fun to see them uh, throwing them around. Um, it was also fun to see them playing with this, the cliche of, like, hey, you break a, 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 an airplane's window, it creates a vacuum. Like, I don't know if in real life the vacuum <laughs> would be that, like, that level of insane, but it's a, it's, it's a film cliche that it has had been used in the past. But I love how they, they switched it to, you know, ha them having a fight right in front of that, uh, that vacuum with uh, the bad guy tricking uh, Michelle and choking her. And then Michelle finally uh, plugging that uh, hole with the man's uh, body yeah. uh, and his frozen face, yeah. see, like seeing <laughs> the outside. Uh, even with the grenade thing, uh, the, you know, the, the other dude, like, just trying to blow up, blow up the plane, even though, again, a grenade. If, if, if they might complain, because you're complaining about the grenade, my complaint is that the grenade is just not big enough. Like, you use it with TNT. Like, you don't use, you know. Okay. Well, fair enough. You, yeah. you make a good defense there. Uh, I mean, probably, I guess, in that case, the most ridiculous thing is the repressurizing of the cabin uh, with the dude's uh, head sticking out the window. Yeah. <laughs> which is fun, though. Wait, which a, I would I would I, not replace for the world. Uh, but I don't think Nathaniel would care for that. Oh, yeah. Fuck that. Though. I mean, <laughs> this is not a movie for Nathaniel. Yeah. I mean, I like how we get the shot, too, of the guys just, like, face... <laughs> His fake face sticking out. It's just like, frozen. Yeah, frozen. Which, which I mean, would happen. That is correct, uh, I think. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, does it matter? Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also like how well um, uh, Sonata and Yo fight together, too. It's nice to see them mm -hmm. just both, like, team up and stuff like that. And almost throughout the film, it feels like when they finally get, like, teamed up, uh, that's when like the bad guys really go down. Um, yeah, although you don't see it as often as you w would want to. Cause most of the time they're either separated or one person is injured or the other one is injured. So it's, it's there are very few scenes where you like throughout an entire fight scene, whether it's this one, uh, California, California. Or yeah, California. Uh, this one at the restaurant, California, or at the final showdown. It's like. There's shit ton of fighting, and uh, only a small moment is when they're both fighting together against the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right. Uh, because otherwise it'd be unfair. Because they kind of mow down the bad guys real bad. It feels like both mm -hmm. of them are such great fighters that they can more or less take out the bad guys one v one. But two v one, it's just it's just unfair for the bad guys. I mean, Michelle straight up took out the last bad guy, one v one. Yeah, yeah. And he had a freaking chainsaw. So. Anyways, we're, we're going to just walk through. I think there's uh, four major set pieces. We'll move to the next one now, which is the car bomb, which starts out just with a literal bang uh, the way. Mm -hmm. And it also, I mean, it literally kills uh, the wife and kid. So it's uh, it, it goes there. It, it's uh, As other people have commented, it's, uh, it's a cute-looking kid, too. Uh, so that kid uh, is not long for this world. Um, and then it immediately um, kind of ascends to a uh, a car chase scene, which yeah, rage car chase yeah, scene, <laughs> which I thought was insane. Uh, it was a pretty crazy looking scene, just cars flipping, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of like spatial logic, it's a little bit weaker than like maybe the fist to fist action, but that's understandable. Um, one thing I did like about uh, the car chase scene is like in just about every shot, you can see stuff going on in the background too. So it's probably mm -hmm. like stunt men and like stunt people like driving cars and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a extremely chaotic scene. Um, people, uh, there's uh, Hong Kong, cinema of this time uh has kind of kind of gone to this mode where it's like feels like barely controlled chaos um and i feel mm -hmm. like this scene more than anything else kind of gets into that uh how what do you make of the car chase uh you know how in uh in uh, the police police tataskis we would talk about how there were uh boxes burning everywhere when there was a car chase yeah, yeah. so a car could just like run through boxes yeah here i feel like there were ramps everywhere like <laughs> everywhere <laughs> like the amount of cars that were flipping yeah was insane i loved so i all right i, I just it's like a skateboard car park for cars 
Seriously, I, I love when you had that uh, flying bus out of nowhere. Like, why was it flying? Like, <laughs> yeah. Why was it flying? I don't know. It, it was just bus, and it just crashes against other cars. Yeah, shouldn't the bus it, have it just, just like hit the ga- uh, the, the brake pedal? <laughs> Oh yeah, or, or, but obviously there was a ramp right, right before it, <laughs> and that's why it flew. Like that, that's why there were so many flying cars, and it was just, and you get it from the very beginning. So it, the movie tells you right away. Dude is dude is pissed because it's, they killed his family. He gets on, he gets driving, and the very first next cut is his car fl- uh, jumping many feet over the air to get to cross like this median or whatever and you're like okay there's gonna be there are gonna be cars flying here uh, and then that's that's what it is uh, is it clean no uh, the, are there tons of unnecessary jumps yes <laughs> but the what the movie does a really good job is they they set out so well the reason why the man is full of rage that you follow him mm-hmm you follow this nonsense when it comes to storytelling. Was it obvious that they were going to kill his family? Yes, 100%. The, the, the movie was screaming out, your family's going to die. Your family's going to die. I thought they were going to be killed at the restaurant. I ha- thought they were going to be killed eating breakfast. Now they were killed in the car. But they were going to, like, it was obvious because one of the ple- cliches. There's got to be some police of- yeah. When a police officer says, this is my, uh, I am retiring tomorrow to his wife. Either the police officer will die or his wife will die. Yeah, but we knew the police officer was a star. So, yeah. And the police officer was a star. So, yeah. And if there's a cute, if there's a cute kid, yeah, yeah, they're they're, going to die. Um, So, yeah. The, the, that's exactly uh, expected. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like the car chase from a spatial, like logical sense, isn't very good. But from like the kind of carrying over the emotions of the character and just like a dangerous feel, it's extremely good. I wonder. Uh, so I mean, I've never been to Hong Kong. I think you've been to Hong Kong like twice. Yeah, twice. I wonder for like a local if they were watching this. If this would be like watching, you know, being in uh, like one scene is, I'll say in Seattle terms, like one scene would be in Capitol Hill, the very next cut is in Ballard, and the very next cut is, you know, like I wonder if that's how spatial, spatially messy this is. Very well could be. Uh, hard to say. Yeah. All right. If you're a New Yorker, one being in, uh, in Harlem, the other one being in Brooklyn, the other one being in Bronx, you know, like just, very far away from right right neighborhoods uh, but that scene is not over uh we have uh the japanese man uh basically uh the food chase? jump out of his car and somehow mm-hmm. hitch a ride onto the villain's car uh which is a pretty crazy looking shot because he's clearly doing something uh running to keep up with the car um well i mean kind of so so there is a little bit of a sleight of hand on that shot on that scene and, and, and you, you can see it if you pay attention, right? The man gets out of one car, runs to, to another one. I'm, say, I'm saying like this is more on the filmmaking, right? Yeah. Runs to the other car and then jumps onto it. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. I mean, as a stunt, it's a dangerous fucking stunt. But those cars were not driving as fast. No, no. Those, those cars were probably going 10 miles an hour and the film was sped up. Or maybe even 20, maybe 15 miles an hour, which is the speed that a person in good shape can do for probably a five seconds minute or <laughs> well, maybe less. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, it, it, I, I still like it. Um, I still think it's, I know, it's you, amazing. Yeah. And then it trans it, and then it kind of goes back into the hand to hand combat, uh, where we have mm-hmm. like weapons and stuff being like sliced in half, people just grabbing whatever they can. And eventually we end up, uh, kind of in a construction site, I guess, um, where, yeah. Uh, Yamamoto gets buried, basically. Um, Alive. Yeah. Um, and uh, the villain eventually escapes uh, away. Any thoughts on that last part of it? Um, I mean, going stunt wise, that probably was a very dangerous stunt. Because he was getting bur- 
I mean, he was getting like dirt dumped from a very high area, and you could actually see the real human being under that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was clearly a real human. It wasn't even like yeah. your Italian dummy. So, I mean, as the stunt goes, um, it was very impressive. Uh, I mean, yikes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I also really liked, I, I love the, the, the actual fight. So, I mean, whether it's a stunt double or not, like, uh, there's lots of tension there because he's, he's in that ditch. And then, you know, you got, uh, he's basically almost saved by Michelle who starts fighting with uh, the bad guy on on that uh, digger or whatever it's called. Like, yeah, I wrote... I mean, she basically wins the fight, but she has to save him because he is literally buried. Well, she she wins the fight, but not necessarily because her point was not to get to stop him from dumping the dirt onto him. He still dumps the dirt, but he runs away, the bad guy. Right, right. So, uh, tell me. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's go on. By the way, did you catch uh, the background of the villains in this? That, uh, like, they were in a war. I, no- I noticed that. Yeah. Uh, and they were all like, like it's a band of band of brothers, basically. Right. Well, n- not technically brothers. They're more like brothers and. No, no, but like I mean, I'm talking about like. Yeah, yeah. They're like brothers of war. Band of brothers, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, um, yeah. I, yeah. I believe um, the implication is that they are mainland Chinese, uh, so they are not from Hong Kong, so they're outsiders again. Um, so they're mainland Chinese, and I believe that is the uh, they are veterans of the Chinese-Vietnamese War, uh, which happened in the late 70s, I think. Oh, So I think that okay. is the implication there. Uh, Were they, but they didn't speak Mandarin. In that scene, did no, they? they didn't. But there's a lot of mainland Chinese that are Cantonese too, and also it's like it's a Hong Kong movie, so they're going to play fast and loose with the actual dialogue. Well, they didn't with Japan with the Japanese language in the scenes that they were in Japan. So. It's true, but th- there are still like a hundred million Cantonese speakers in like the mainland too, so they could just Jesus Christ. Okay. So, so there's a ton of. Uh, it's not just Hong Kong that speaks Cantonese. It's it's a, a lot of Chinese. I mean, yeah. Okay. So I mean, it, yeah. In fact, the ones that probably come to Hong Kong tend to be the ones from Cantonese areas because those are right outside of Hong Kong, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, okay. yeah, brief interlude, just quick, uh, at least my interpretation of their motivation there. Um, okay, so now we get to California, which I think might be this. This might be the worst plane uh, since you convinced me away from the grenade in the plane. What convinced uh, Yamamoto to want to stage um, to use them as bait? in this bar which is loaded with glass and most importantly people um and a ton of people end up dying (laughs) due to uh the decision to uh set up a trap in this place uh do you have a defense of this i i do but it's not the best (laughs) okay you're you're Uh, a lawyer he was counting uh he was counting that there was lots of people Mm. and he assumed that uh you know, a bunch of gangsters who do not want to be caught would not make a fucking scene mowing down dozens of people with a machine gun. I think that's, you know, to, truth be told, I feel like that's usually a cliche, right? It's like, hey, you, you better be in a busy place. That way you don't get uh, killed like if you're in a quiet place, that's more likely for you know a person who wants to kill you to kill you. So yeah, being on the busiest uh, place perhaps is the the area where you know you're. They they might try to do something to you, but not like bring a machine gun and shoot an old lady first before and and her husband before starting shooting at you. After probably mowing down everyone on that line of fire before getting to you. I, I, I think it would not have been reasonably anticipated that that would have, was going to happen. True, true, true. At the same point, the uh, Yamamoto deserves to be fired immediately after this decision uh, to put all of these civilians in danger. Um. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> but I mean, 
Cause I don't know. I, I mean, it's funny. Um, I've been watching um, uh, Narcos. So I know this is a weird uh, segue. But I've been watching, or a weird tangent. But I've been watching Narcos. I watched Narcos. Uh, now I've been watching Narcos Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, throughout like in the first like few seasons narcos when it's in Colombia, you don't see much of like mowing down folks in public. But in Narcos Mexico now you see it because uh, I guess the gangs are were much are, were much crazier in the nineties in Mexico than they were in Colombia in the eighties. The reason I point this out is there are two types of gangs. One that will, you know, like try to stab you in public and then run away. And then two, the one will, which will just machine gun the shit out of people. In the 80s, the common commonality was the, the number one, not the number two, not the machine gun ones. <laughs> but this movie was ahead of its time and it had the gangsters with the machine gun just mowing down everyone in that right. place. Make- I mean, I guess the implication too is that they are war veterans. So you could probably draw some like through line from that, uh, like choosing to bring like a machine gun uh, uh, to, to that. Uh, regardless, it is a very risky plan that results in a lot of innocent people dying. Um, the bad guy also makes a questionable decision by ruining his advantage of like ambushing them and just wasting a random old woman first. Um, very brutal, yes, uh, but why? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but most importantly, the most befuddling decision of all is why is California tic tac toe themed? Do you have a defense for this? Uh, they had the neon lights for that, and they were like, "Okay, let's use yeah. it." Yeah. What's thing. a popular game in America? Tic tac toe. Let's do it. Uh, I kind of love it, but it, it's it's it, like immediately uh, that's what I wrote. California tic tac toe question mark. Um, it was so big too. There was it was like twenty tic tac toe boards on there. <laughs> I thought it, I always thought it was just the same one. Oh, was it? Just really okay. Maybe they kept showing. Or no, maybe you're right. Maybe there were smaller ones. Yeah, I thought there was a bunch of them, but uh, it was just it was just a shit ton of neon. I think I think they straight up were like we want as many sparks as possible. So they brought in, like, they probably went into, like, some, uh, you know, neon light hardware, like, seller, and they just bought a bunch of neon lights, whatever they were, and they're like, yeah, we're going to, this is going to be our set, just a shit ton of neon lights, and it happened to, you know, be a whole bunch of tic-tac-toe neon lights because they couldn't sell that shit yeah, anywhere. they got the surplus. Who buys a tic-tac-toe neon, light, yeah. neon lights? Fair enough. Yeah, you're, you're probably not wrong. They're like, yeah, we're going to destroy all this stuff, and they're like, cool let's do it um uh, yeah i mean basically the scene starts with them getting ambushed with the old woman being wasted and like basically the marine vet or the veteran basically going crazy with the machine gun just mowing down everything um one thing that except for his targets yeah except for his targets uh one thing that did catch my eye here is that the pedestrian or the innocent pedestrians here are perhaps some of the least helpful um that you see uh one of them grabs michelle yo's uh, foot while she's about to take action uh, another one like stand up and like uh, tell uh, uh, Yamamoto to sit down uh, or get down and immediately get shot while he does it uh, so uh, some uh, head scratching maneuvers there by the pedestrians there who probably should have just kept their heads down um, what do you think of the scene uh, I mean it was fun uh, again did not expect uh, so much shooting and so many innocent people dying um uh, it was funny how the old the granny is the first one shot, and we both have uh, clearly we both have some notes on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, what was going now into the the actual like fights and this was the one where you definitely have a very quick and rapid uh, succession of, of weapons. So there are moments where you're having guns, and to you know stop the guy with a gun, you uh, they hit. You know, they used a club to hit him. And then, you know, they have, like, one of those uh, uh, poles for, like, pole dancing or whatever, like, swinging that shit around. And then, you know, you have glass bottles. And, and you, you just have basically anything you can imagine being a weapon is weaponized here. And weaponized a lot. 
and it's really fun. I mean, in that sense, uh, the, the and and between that and having all the neon sparks uh, breaking around and the amount of mercury poisoning that everyone got from it, uh, was just a very fun uh, scene to watch. They destroy that that bar. They California is no more. Yeah, and I I wouldn't be surprised that uh, if Michelle. Uh, you dies uh, young for uh, due to ma- mercury poisoning <laughs> uh, in her blood at some moment. It's probably because of that. It's probably thanks to tic tac toe, really. If we're if we're being a hundred percent honest about it. Well, because that sh- that was uh, that fell like on top of her, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, or did she or dodge it? I'm not sure. Double. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, one, uh, I, I got this from a letterbox review from Laird. Uh, I don't have much to add. I think you described it quite well. It's it's just a fun scene. I think for a lot of people, this is their favorite action scene of the film. I'm not sure if it's my Ooh. favorite, but uh, here here's what Laird said. If there's one thing Hong Kong action excels at, uh, well, really, there's a laundry list. It's using the environment to sell the intensity of a fight. I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a nightclub shootout brawl in this that leaves no piece of glass intact. Indeed. <laughs> uh nothing nothing indeed uh they really i mean wreck that one of the few times where like uh one of the two main characters gets like really hurt is uh in this case michelle is literally with a glass bottle Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. which looked painful i mean he stabbed her yeah uh okay well that's a uh that's a good scene uh in the meantime we have uh michael's kill uh blah 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 uh we will move to the finale where both of the leads now are super pissed off because uh Mm -hmm. uh uh, yamamoto has lost his family uh michelle yo has lost michael her her she has lost her stalker stalker adoring reminder uh (laughs) yeah uh and uh we uh, get to this part where, like, she goes to a place called Yip Laboratories. Um, I think so. Michelle Yeoh has been recredited rec- as a lot of different uh, names throughout the year, but um, in this film, she is credited as Michelle Yip. So I believe that's like that. That's like her acting name in this film rather than Michelle Yeoh, Ooh. which she would eventually go by. So she goes to Yip Laboratories. So I think maybe the implication is that person is her father uh, that like gives her the tank, maybe, uh, not totally sure, uh, who says, I think this should work, but then again, who knows? I'm like, oh God, what is this going to be? <laughs> and uh, it does not disappoint. You want to, uh, I'm going to kick it to you so you can start off uh, the discussion on this uh, finale. So yeah, I mean, uh this is where Yamamoto first comes in, and he completely fails, like at the very beginning, uh, because his car flips, and then he's about to like being blown up by the bad guy. Uh, yeah, she comes to the rescue with uh, this biggest tank, and the first thing she does is, you know, you would assume, try to kill the bad guy, but no, she moves the other car, with the man inside the car upside down, the man inside with half his torso out and he moves them and this is the man is there like i mean this is the actor again no dummy and she moves that with her tank or armored vehicle and then she just completely destroys all the foundation of where the the bad guy is <laughs> yeah it's, yeah we, we, we get that great sweet. shot of seeing like uh yamamoto like the car moving and it's just like focused on his face and you can clearly see it moving uh, uh, but yeah sorry I interrupted yeah you. and you can see him <laughs> somewhat terrified <laughs> justifiably probably for real <laughs> i'm assuming they only did that in what for one take yeah uh um, I also didn't know there was uh, uh, defense contractors in Hong Kong, but what do you know? <laughs> I mean, what you would assume, yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, again, th- then there you got the um, the souped up gun, uh, the bad guy, because he souped up his um, his bullets, so they blow up as he as he shoots them. So that's pretty sweet. And then he had that. Uh, glass with whatever liquid it is at first i thought it was nit- nitroglycerin but uh it didn't explode when the entire building fell so probably not nitroglycerin but whatever it was it made the tra- the tank explode 
And that was pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, it set the whole tank on fire pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, it blew up at the end. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, all of that was just very fun, kind of chaotic. Uh, but, I mean, my favorite, of course, is the chainsaw fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be inappropriate if this film ended on something other than, uh, like, person to person fighting. Yeah. And, uh, the Michelle and the bad guy fighting with him with the sh- uh, chainsaw and her just with whatever it's laying around which c- anything can be weaponized uh, and her just completely destroying him is I mean probably one of the best fights because at first it's like the, the stakes are high the chainsaw is super dangerous mm-hmm. uh, and you know she was definitely not in the upper hand uh, and yet uh, with a swift kick on the neck, she neutralizes him enough to basically ruin him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great fight, and the chainsaw does add that extra level of danger um, that we had. I mean, like the whole, all the fights feel super brutal and swift, but the chainsaw just adds that little extra bit of spice to that last one uh, to make it mm-hmm. uh, there. Um, yeah, you no, know, you summed it up well. Um, it's it's a fun one. Um, okay, well, I think that's more or less most of what I have here. Um, uh, what is uh, your favorite of those uh, big uh, set pieces or fight scenes? So we have the airplane opener, the car bomb into chase scene into being piled up with dirt, California, and we have the tank finale. I mean, to me, is the, the chainsaw. The chainsaw is like... To me, that that was my my favorite. Uh, just, uh, just the progression on on the different weapons that are used, and just how you know she gets thrown around, the bad guy gets thrown around, uh, but then you know her winning at the very last minute. Uh, it's just uh, one of the more intense fights. Uh, so I think they left uh, the best for the last. Yeah, totally get that. I would. For me, I think that and the airplane scene are 1A and 1B for me. I really like the airplane just because it really sets the tone immediately. And for me, mm-hmm. I can usually tell pretty fast if I'm going to like the action in some of these films uh, because of like the rhythm and the pacing and it goes. And this one goes at just like the pace that I really love. It's just like really mm-hmm. relentless and brutal. And like that, that same pacing is there in that chainsaw fight at the end too. So there's a lot to love mm-hmm. in there. But I like uh, kind of like the hot potato with the grenade uh, in the in the airplane and stuff like that. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of people like California the most. I tend to like gun violence just a little bit less uh, than other stuff. Uh, but that sentence is kind of weird. I like gun violence less. Gun li- violence is bad. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I like it in films a in little film. bit less than uh, hand-to-hand type stuff or with, like, fun weapons and stuff. So uh, I think I might grade that slightly lower, but it's still uh, a very good uh, fight scene. Um, okay, you you look like you have something to say. Yeah, no, I mean when it comes to gun violence, I mean I uh, or gun violence, like gun violence in the, movies, the, or the shootings, like shooting scenes. Um, uh, they're loud uh, and they can be messy, and that's perhaps why like lots of folks. Uh, I mean, per- perhaps you're right that uh, most folks uh, like the California scene the most, and I mean it has a lot of good fighting outside the gun stuff. But I feel like it's a common. It's more common to actually um, enjoy the the hand to hand combat over like guns, like you're just shooting all around. Like, I mean, if you think about like action films that we that we you know folks really love today, you know, the number one goes to, would be John Wick, which is mostly hand to hand combat, and even when the uh, guns are used. They're used in a very close... Very hand-to-hand uh, way. Yeah, so I, I, I have a feeling that, you know, when it comes to action, um, the whole, like, just mowing down with a machine gun and folks just shooting each other around is... Um, yeah, fair enough. It's, it's not as fun. Yeah, I mean, it's also the unique parts to this are more the hand-to-hand stuff that you see in the Hong Kong films of this time, too. Yeah. yeah, unlike the cliches, like uh, the retiring cop 
getting his shit ruined, or uh, the boss saying, "Give me your badge <laughs> and your gun," which she did neither. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, just, I had to point that out because it was out of place, and also she doesn't even do it. <laughs> Yeah, they got all of the good cliches and the bad cliches. Uh, 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 and when she tries, she actually gives the badge. He's like, what? You can't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so uh, who won the movie? Um, this one's a tough one. Uh, I gave it to Michelle. Okay. I'll give it to Meng Hoi, who was the uh, fight choreographer for it. Um, oh, well, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I have attempted. I mean, like, I could see giving it to Michelle or Hiroyuki Sonata, anyone but uh, Michael Wong. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, rating of the film and any last thoughts? I think I put it at eight and a half. It's highly enjoyable. Um, I have other notes, but they're not like that worth it. So, yeah. The, Eight and a half, highly enjoyable movie. Yeah. Um, From a fun standpoint, it's hard to nitpick much. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I already just trashed the, all the non non uh, action areas. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we are a spoiler filled podcast, and of course, we uh, spoiled this. <laughs> if you were interested about plot, yeah, we give our spoiler but warning I, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but the, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is that although we spoil the plot, perhaps, uh, I do highly recommend watching it. Um, so this is, I'm giving it eight and a half. I actually do not give my numbers. Are, I'm more conservative with my numbers, perhaps. Uh, so that eight and a half is very high for me. Uh, I will also say that um, the reason I say watch it is because we didn't even talk about all the uh, fight scenes. We did not. Yeah, there's a couple uh, small ones sprinkled in there, too. Yeah, that, that was also really fun, like the one on the boat. Yeah. Uh, no, if, even even the first yeah. one. Even yeah, the first it, one. it's a good one. I mean, in a lot of films, that would be one of the best fight scenes. But in here, it's like mm -hmm. like not even making the talking points in an hour-long discussion of the film. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, I guess if it was the last thought is, watch this. Even if you listen to our podcast and, you, and yeah. you know, we quote unquote spoil the movie for you, this is plot wise, this movie is not great. So, like, yeah. this is all about the fun. Right, right. So, I take it you would be perfectly willing to see more films from this era of Hong Kong. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm hoping for that. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, for me, I actually um, I have the same rating, eight and a half out of ten. Um, the flaws of it are pretty obvious. Um, and I think it kind of just depends how much you forgive, uh, kind of like the Michael Wong character or how much you get into that, uh, as far as like, if this is, uh, perfect or not, uh, for you. But I think, uh, from an action choreography point of view, uh, for me, it's, it's very ideal, um, as far as stuff. Uh, so I just really like the mix of it. I like how we get, um, uh, Michelle Yeoh, uh, fighting, like a little bit of a gender uh i like it when we get women and men fighting too so i like that part of Ooh. it and it's just bristling with that creativity coming out of hong kong and it's easy to see uh i'm sure for you uh why all the stunt people would like a film like this too um just with all the yeah, stuff yeah, going sure. on in the movie um okay and the, go ahead yeah and this movie is smart enough to kill the uh, weakest character it's true they they Maybe they uh, should have switched the kill order, so maybe Michael Wong could have been bumped off at the 20-minute mark, <laughs> and the, the life <laughs> no, of kid could have made it further. Uh, I, I was going to say, like, plot-wise, even though I say it's not the strongest plot, uh, plot-wise is smart enough to... Uh, uh, smart enough to not only kill, to, to kill him, actually, around the end, to give some, you know, uh, an additional push for Michelle, and also to... To make sure that, you know, there's no possible way that she ends up with him. Yeah, it's true. And and, and that which makes her character even stronger. Yeah, it would have made it, it would have made me like the film a lot less if she it show, ended up being romantically involved with him in any way. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Inyaki, for the discussion. That concludes the film to film podcast of Royal Warriors 1986. Uh, and uh, I recommend everyone go check out this film. Um, and you oh, what do you rate it uh, same into you eight and a half 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can uh, send us an email, zafilm to film at gmail.com. You can also send us a tweet. We are also now posting these on YouTube at film to film. Uh, so check those places out, and uh, we'll see you all in a few weeks. <laughs>